everybody. It's great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study where we are walking through the Bible in a year. Today is June 16th and yesterday we said goodbye to an, our old friend Elijah and we begin to study the life of Elisha and we have looked at a comparison and contrast between Elijah and Elisha and today we get to read further into the stories of this amazing prophet Elisha. He really was like and similar to Jesus in many different ways. And I wanted to really talk about seven different things that I've pulled out today from the different stories that we read in our scripture. We're in the book of 2 Kings. We had a number of different stories that we read today. So I want to start with 2 Kings 5.26 and just take you through these seven areas that Elisha was acting like Jesus. So let's reminisce a little bit. And as I tell you, these stories are these seven scriptures. Let's see if we can't remember something similar that Jesus did. The first one, I found it amazing when Elisha said in 2 Kings 5.26, Don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from the chariot to meet you? Jesus, of course, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and today he lives with and in us through the Holy Spirit. So I thought that was beautiful. Number two, in 2 Kings 6 verse 9, Elisha would warn the king, do not go near that place for the Arameans are planning to mobilize troops there. Jesus during his life on earth knew people's thoughts. He knew when the soldiers were coming to take him captive on his last uh, night, and he just knew things that were happening, just like Elisha knew things. Number three, Elisha tells the king, even words that you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. That was 2 Kings 6.12. Jesus knew people's thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. Uh, didn't he tell Nathaniel something about, um, I saw what you did under the under the fig tree, or the yeah, the tree, when he was calling him to be a disciple. So that was, that reminded me of Jesus when I read that. Number four, Elisha prayed, Lord, please make them blind. That was 2 Kings 6, verse 18. Of course, Jesus didn't pray for anyone to believe, be blind. He made people be able to see. He released the blind people. And so when I read that, I thought, oh, we know a Savior who gives the blind sight, and isn't that wonderful? Number five, I loved it when Elisha said, Oh Lord, open their eyes so that they can see all the heavenly hosts around. In verse 20, I believe that Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, could see the angels that were attending him. He knew that they were there. They gave him comfort, and they gave him strength during the 40 days in the wilderness. Six, Elisha never was never disturbed generally, I'm observing this, by his present situation. And he was always encouraging others to stop fearing. Didn't Jesus always say, why are you afraid? Why did you doubt? Why, why, why? He was so confident in his present circumstances. And then number seven, in 2 Kings 8 verse 10, Elisha wept. Do you remember? There was a verse, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And it, it just hurt Elisha to see what was happening to the people. And Jesus wept over Jerusalem as well because he knew, the, he knew what was coming for them. And he wished that they had made a different choice. Now, let's, um, let's talk about the first story that we read today, the healing of Naaman. And I wanted to give you a couple of historical references and background references so you understand the culture of the meaning of these stories. Naaman was healed of his leprosy in the story that we read today. Certainly good for the Arameans. Did you know in Luke 4, 27, it gives us a clue that no Israelite was ever healed of leprosy during Elisha's time on earth. Isn't that interesting? Naaman is an Aramean, and here he is 
uh, healed. And it was good for the Arameans, certainly for the king, because the king wanted him to live a long life, and leprosy was a death sentence. They did not have a cure for that, and so you would eventually die of it. And he had evidently been struggling with his leprosy for some time, and, but yet he was the commander of the king's army, so uh, it probably didn't impede his ability to do his job, but if it would, and it certainly could, then he wouldn't be able to be commander of the army any longer. When he was told to wash, uh, notice that he was told to wash seven times. And we've talked about the significance of seven in this Bible study many, many times. And in this instance, seven is God's number. It's a number of completeness, and it shows us that the wash was an act of God, that God was doing it. So we want to understand that that helped spread the fame of Yahweh throughout the ancient world, world which is what God uh, wants to do. He is worth uh, praise and admiration and fame and glory and praise, and much of what he does is for that purpose. So this is uh, what happened. It did spread his fame throughout many people, and um, I'm sure the Arameans would have heard of it as well. The Arameans' god, Baal, or Baal, um, had healing. They believed he had healing powers. So if another god actually healed Naaman, but their god, Baal, couldn't, that was another way to, um, to show the strength in Yahweh. The Israelites' god was greater than any other gods. Now, when Elisha traps the Arameans over in 2 Kings 6, the third story that we read today, he, he did something, and he, he tells the people to give them food and drink and send them home. Now, we have to understand there is something culturally significant. Anytime there is a meal, fellowship is partaken over a meal and it means something significant. You see, eating under one's roof in the Old Testament in ancient times was a covenant of peace. The Armenians at this point were bound by social custom not to attack because of the kindness of Elisha. And Elisha showed this gift of hospitality and protection. And for a while, for a while, uh, in between the lines here, the Armenians were at peace with the Israelites because of this hospitality that Elisha showed them. In our Bibles, in 2 Kings 6.24, it starts a new section. Um, Ben-Hadad besieges Samaria. And the verse in verse 24 begins, Sometime later you see the Armenians fighting again. Well, the sometime later is the period where they were honoring the custom of peace because of the hospitality of the meal. So sometime later probably didn't mean the next day or the next week. It meant, we, we don't know how long exactly, but it was probably a generally a good amount of time, we'll say. Now, we need to understand all these things are happening to Israel for one reason. God is trying to draw the people back to him. And it's really, it's really not working in this, in this particular case because of the decisions that the people are making. Elisha announces a prophecy in 2 Kings 7.1. In 24 hours, he says, this siege will be over and we will have plenty to eat. They had been under a famine for so, so long. We can't really imagine even what that is like. But God did provide food. The prophecy came true, and God provided for the people in a remarkable way. And again, it was to turn them back. So I want to share with you as we close today three principles that we can glean from all of these different stories today if we kind of put them together in a nugget. Here's the nugget for today. Number one, God will go to remarkable lengths to get your attention. He may have been doing some of these things we say to get Israel's attention, but it's quite possible he was doing all of these things to get one person's attention. Maybe it was the king. Maybe it was someone else. God does remarkable things in our life today to get your attention and your attention alone. Don't ever underestimate the Lord's love for you and the Lord's wanting to draw you to him and to keep your attention on him. And he'll go to any length to do it. Number two, principle number two. 
God cares for the, those who trust in him. He cares for the sparrows. Notice the birds, the squirrels. No one is providing them food. Yes, they're finding food, but God is giving them their daily provision. And this can be seen through the story of the Shumite woman that we read about today, how God preserved her. So God will take care of you. Number three, principle number three. God reveals information to his people who ask him. You know, you have to wonder, what were the conversations that Elisha was having with the Lord? Uh, you know, if you could just be in the room with him during his prayer time, wouldn't that be interesting to read his prayer journal or to hear his prayers? You know, one of the best, I think the best verses in the entire Bible is Jeremiah 33, 3. You know what that says? It says, the Lord says to you and me, ask me, ask me whatever you want to know, and I will tell you remarkable secrets, remarkable things that you just don't know. We have free access. If we believe in Jesus, we have free access to the throne. We have free access to pray to the Lord God and he will hear us no matter what time of day it is, no matter when it is, no matter what we want to talk about. And that is just such a blessing that we can pray to the Lord and that we can believe and know without a doubt that he hears us. He not only hears us, but he absolutely cares about whatever we care about, whatever is on our heart, heavy on our heart. It's heavy on the Lord's as well. So go today. In the name of the Lord, rest assured that your prayers are heard, your cares and concerns are understood by the Lord God, and that He is bringing all things together. Don't make it too hard for Him to get your attention. Give it to Him freely, for He is freely standing by, wanting to fellowship with you this day. Well, I pray this has been a blessing to you. I cannot wait to continue in the Bible tomorrow as we continue reading about the stories of Elisha. I hope you'll join me. Blessings to you. Shalom.